name is Audrey Vernick. I'm the Director of Patient and Family Advocacy for the Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery Alliance, and we are a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to supporting families whose children have drug-resistant epilepsy, meaning there's some point on the epilepsy surgery journey. So they may not know or even be considering surgery yet, but we, we consider um, all children with drug-resistant epilepsy to be in our the community we serve. And we um, support families with research information and community. And so we initiate and fund research. Um, we provide tons of information, which is what we're going to talk about today. And then we have um, many different avenues for building community, our family conference, um, monthly power hours, uh, regional events, all different kinds of things. This is a pretty big question, and um, we could talk about this for quite a long time. Um, if you go to our website, um, you will find, um, if you go in the search bar, you can search um, navigating, uh, sorry, navigating the IEP process, and it'll take you to this page. And then um, click on start the course. And um, the reason, oops, the reason I take you here first is because um, oftentimes um, the questions that come up, uh, the reason we created the course was that the kind of the general questions of like, how do I start the school year? Or what, what should I be thinking about? That was the whole point of the course. So we um, created this step-by-step -step guide that walks you through every step in the IEP process. And so here's just a couple of examples of the curriculum. Um, we really use the um, IDEA as a foundation for, um, you know, the actual steps in the process, starting with referral, evaluation, you know, all the way through to developing the IEP. You can see kind of all the different um, modules there. Um, so to answer your question a little more generally, um, the questions that I've been hearing a lot so far um, at the beginning of the school year on Facebook or in our community or on our power hour the other night, um, so things like, um, I don't know if my child's teacher has read their IEP, what do I do? And we actually just published a blog post about this where we um, uh, talk about three different documents that you could be creating for your teacher at the beginning of the school year or the school staff. Um, one is like an all about me where you um, input information about the child that's kind of like general information you want the team to know about the child in their day-to-day -day setting. Um, so it's different than the IEP, but it might also include like, here are some of the key goals my child is working on this year. And um, if there's any really pertinent medical information, like just a reminder, they have epilepsy or whatever it is that you want to make sure is like front and center. And then I have parents that make 20 copies and hand it out to everyone, like the, the bus driver, the teacher, the nurse, the front office, the librarian, you know, that sort of thing. So you have, you know, that there's at least like a brief overview of information given to every staff um, that, that you are encountering at least. Um, and then uh, you can also um, create, make sure that you have a good um, seizure action plan and emergency healthcare plan. Um, we do have a section in this course on emergency planning, um, which talks about all different kinds of emergency documents that you might need to create. Um, and you know, there's more than what is the rescue medication, right? There has to be a plan for how is the team gonna be trained in using the rescue medication and what is the emergency protocol? Like how many minutes are we waiting before we administer a seizure medication? And when should 911 be called? And maybe the child can't go in an ambulance because of some trauma. So that all needs to be part of that, you know, really clearly spelled out. And then another thing, I, another tool I really like is the IEP at a glance. So some school districts, they have um, a way to just click a button and print out an, an at a glance of the IEP, meaning it only includes certain sections. It's sort of an overview of the IEP. And it generally includes the child's eligibility, um, a little bit of the present levels, just kind of, I think, a summary, the goals and the accommodations. And so that's another thing. I have parents that make copies of their IEP at a glance and laminate it and put it in the kid's backpack so that if there's ever a question or a substitute or something were to come up and it's like, we didn't know what to work on that day or we didn't know what the accommodations were. Well, it's right there, right? It's always, always front and center. And that's also something that you could give to a new teacher or give on back to school night just to be like, hey, I want to make sure that you have this information. And then lastly, you can call an IEP meeting at any time. So if you have concerns at the beginning of the school year that you don't feel can be adequately addressed by these tools, or you don't feel that you're being listened to, or that it's receptive uh, from the school team, you can say, hey, I'd like to have an IEP meeting to discuss 
some concerns that I have. I'm not sure the staff is up to speed on my child's needs. And they have to have that meeting within 30 days. So I recommend putting the meeting request in writing so that you're you know, notifying them that can be done via email, but you you want to make sure that you're asking for, um, you know, for that to happen. And so then you get to sit down with the IEP team and have that conversation. Um, one of the things that I think, um, you know, whenever I speak about IEPs or 504s or just educating a child in general, regardless of whether or not you have an IEP or 504, if you have a child with any kind of special learning or health need, you have to start with a detailed evaluation. Um, as a parent, you don't know how to support your child if you don't understand what the deficits are, and then you want to bring that information to the team. And also the strengths, because sometimes school teams are working on skills that the child has already mastered. So if we don't evaluate, we don't know the strengths and deficits. So that's always one of the most important places to start. Um, there is a difference between um, an IEP and a 504. So um, you can read our guide to, to learn more about that. But one key thing I will say about the difference is that the IEP has legal protections. Um, so if your child qualifies for an IEP, I would recommend not accepting a 504 plan because um, there is there are timelines that are required under IEP that are not required under a 504, meaning you can ask for a 504 plan and they can say, okay, and it might be months before they actually get back to you and write a plan. Whereas when you request an IEP, they have a certain timeline to follow to complete the assessments and hold the IEP meeting. I think it's a total of about 60 days. Um, it, it's it's going to vary a little bit by state. So you don't want to give up those protections, but you not every child qualifies for an IEP. So to qualify for an IEP, you have to have three things. You have to have um, meet an eligibility criteria under IDEA, which is not the same as having a disability. Um, that's spelled out really clearly in our course. Um, you have to require special education, and then you have to require related services. So if you don't meet those three things, you can't have an IEP. So that's where a 504 might come in. If the child just needs accommodations, you can have a disability um, and and require accommodations, and then you can get a 504 plan. And that is basically writing out accommodations that the child might need um, to use throughout their school day. Um, the IEP team or the 504, um, they will only help the child with needs that are outlined in an assessment. So I, I hear, this is another back to school question I get all the time. I told the school that my child had X problem and they're not doing anything about it. And that's because telling the school is not enough. Knowing what your child needs is not enough. You have to request in writing an evaluation from the school in all areas of suspected disability. So if your child has um, an attention deficit disorder, an emotional dysregulation disorder, a learning disability, a speech impairment, and um, and a medical issue, you would want those five evaluations, right? So you're going to be asking for every single evaluation that is needed. Then you can take those assessments and meet with the IEP team to decide together what the contents of the IEP will be or the 504. And sometimes parents will request an IEP and then they don't meet criteria for an IEP, but now we have those robust assessments to use um, that data to determine what accommodations are needed. So every child in a school district should is is should be evaluated if if it's warranted. Um, not every child needs to be evaluated, so the school can say no, we don't need to evaluate your child, but they have to put that in writing and explain why. So if there if there's a need that you think your child has, the only way you can get the school to listen and to act on it is to request an assessment in all areas of suspected disability. And then, and look at how long this section is. Whoa, my goodness, it's all of that. Then we get to identification, which is determining whether or not the child qualifies for an IEP. And then if they do, then we have a lot of steps in building the IEP and the follow-on uh, placement, reviewing and revising and reevaluating. So it's not a one-step process. And I think that um, another thing I hear at Back to School, I'm just gonna throw this in there too, is the team wrote the IEP we showed up and I looked at it and they said I had to sign it or my kid wasn't going to get any services. So I signed it, but I'm not happy with it. So the IEP team includes the parent and, and by transition age, it includes the child. So if you're walking into a meeting and the IEP team is 
giving you an IEP to sign and telling you we wrote it and it's done, that's not a valid IEP. So then you would want to go through our course and find out what are the steps in the process that I need to be um, looking at so that I am, I'm doing the right thing. So here are the steps um, and all of this is in our guide. Um, the IEP process is complicated um, and 504s. Um, but if you learn these steps, then you're going to be able to be a better advocate for your child. Our children can't advocate for themselves yet. So that's our role as parents is to teach them how to grow up, become adults and be able to self-advocate, right? In adulthood, that's, that's the end goal that we all want for our children, you know, to the extent possible. But in the meanwhile, we are the ones that are in those meetings with the team and that we have to be the ones that are knowing our rights, knowing what the, what the rules of the game are, what the steps are and how to hold the school accountable to do those things so that your child can get what they need in that school setting.